Um, welcome. We are recording class tonight. Um, and so, yeah, I just want to start off um, saying welcome, happy Wednesday, and um, we'll start with some announcements. So, or actually first, today we'll be discussing the abolition of the tech industry. We're joined by Wendy Liu, author of Abolish Silicon Valley, who will discuss the ties between the tech industry and capitalism, and Ria Kaluri, who is the founder of Radical AI Network and member of Defund SFPD Now, um, that will have an open Q&A session for her speaking portion. And last, we'll have Cecia Dominguez from Color Coded Collective discussing abolition technology. Um, and announcements, I will pass to Charlie, um, who I believe has more details on each of these. Yes, um, so we have two quick announcements before we get into it. Um, the first is that um, there is going to be a resource fair on the 14th, um, that is this Sunday. Um, I didn't have time to pull up the uh, details, but it's one that we've um, talked about a few times before and it's um, being organized through uh, Defund SFPD as well as some other you know, collaborating organizations. So if someone who does have that info handy could drop that in the chat, that would be wonderful. And then um, the second quick announcement is that um, we are putting together a, um, a little bio profile of the class and of the group um, to submit to One Million Experiments. And One Million Experiments is a um, digital zine that is um, hosted by Project Nia, which is kind of one of the um, big like abolition groups that have been doing work for a while. And it's documenting, you know, different, um, you know, paths towards abolition and different, you know, things that people are trying. And this is one of those things that people are trying. So. Um, if you are interested in um, looking that over or helping write it up, um, please uh, let us know. Um, you can reach out to me. You can reach out to any of the um, coordinators. And yeah, I will pass it back to Alex. Thank you, Charlie. Um, so yeah, um, I'm gonna introduce myself. My name is Alex and I use they, them, Sha pronouns. And my visual description is I am a light brown person with long brown hair in a ponytail. I'm wearing silver hoops and a black uh, zip up hoodie. And um, I also have like a blue scarf wrapped around my chest and um, wearing a silver necklace and my background is blurred with some tapestries in the back. Um, and also um, I'm as far as like connections organizations, um, I am a part of the build abolition coordinator group um, of co organizers and I organize with the US prostitutes collective and um, I am now here uh, as well in the capacity of Project Survive and um, CCSF uh, Collective. Yeah, Charlie. Um, and I'm Charlie. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I am a very light-skinned, white-passing Caribbean Latino with about shoulder length, dark curly hair. I've got glasses on. I've got a um, white uh, wristwatch. And I've got a um, blue, uh, blue, dark blue button up that's got a little pattern of watermelon slices on it. And my background is my bedroom with a bookcase, um, my bed, um, and some pillows. And let me move into the land acknowledgement, which is a practice that, um, that we do here. Um, and so, you know, in that vein, um, at the start of every session, we like to remind people that San Francisco, so-called San Francisco, is located on the unceded and therefore stolen ancestral homelands of the Ramaytush Ohlone peoples, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. Um, if you are non-Indigenous and you're in this space, we encourage you to uplift the work of rematriation and land taxes that the Ramaytush are undertaking. 
um, and the you can pay the um, the Unikin land tax um, through the link that is on this slide, which I believe has been dropped in the chat as well. And then um, we also want to remind people that we are very intentional with how we are creating spaces that center Black people, Indigenous people, and other people of color. Um, we want to move forward by creating practices to prioritize Black folks, Indigenous folks, and folks of color, and to proactively decenter whiteness and to dismantle white supremacy, anti Blackness, misogynoir, and colorism. Because of that, we will be opening our facilitated discussion first to Black folks, Indigenous folks, and other folks of color, centering within that space on um, LGBTQ plus and disabled folks within the last, and, or sorry, with the last five minutes being open to everyone. Uh, we are mindful of creating spaces that are centered on Black folks, Indigenous folks, and other folks of color in the breakout rooms as well. Um, please DM the person marked as host, which I believe tonight is Aira, um, if you are a white person so that we can mindfully arrange the breakout rooms so that you know folks aren't feeling like outnumbered by white people. Um, the chat is always open to everyone, but we do ask white people to please be mindful over taking up too much space um, and you know kind of just being respectful of the chat as a space. And in that vein, the Zoom sessions will continue to be open for everyone to join. Um, we also have a mutual aid fund that goes towards paying speakers for presenting to us. And we do prioritize payments towards Black folks, Indigenous folks, and other speakers of color. Uh, please contribute to the fund if you are less of a systems impacted person and someone who is benefiting from this space. And that is another link that will go in the chat. I'm almost done with the spiel, bear with me. <laughs> um, so our care coordinators, Tiara and Kari, will be providing collective care during the session, again, with Black folks, Indigenous folks, and other people of color prioritized. Please DM them if you are feeling triggered or re-traumatized or activated by any of the content that we're discussing. Um, and if you need to be, or if you need to be provided with care resources, or if you need to go into a breakout room with someone to just take a break from the session and, you know, recenter and reground yourself. Um, our Zoom moderators will be sharing the anonymous care form in the chat where you can provide feedback on the session. Um, something that we have learned in our previous session is that collective care is central to abolition. So please, you know, if you are feeling, you know, activated or triggered or re-traumatized, you know, please, or even just need, you know, to, to talk a weird feeling out with anyone, please, you know, make use of this space. All right, and with that, I will pass it back to Alex. Thank you, Charlie. Um, so we're gonna get started and I'm going to introduce Wendy. Uh, Wendy Liu is a software developer and writer based in San Francisco. She is the author of Abolish Silicon Valley, How to Liberate Technology from Capitalism, which is a memoir recounting her experience as a startup founder, as well as a manifesto for imagining a world without startups. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen now. Hopefully this works out. This one. All right. Does this look okay? Can, could I get like a thumbs up or thumbs down if, it, if it's working or not working? Great, thank you so much. Cool, all right. Well, first of all, um, thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me. It's really a privilege to be able to speak to you all. If it looks like my eyes are looking um, off the screen, it's because I have two screens and I'm trying to read my transcript. So um, I will, will, may not be able to see um, if anyone messages the chat, but I think if one of the organizers wants to like wave at me, I should be able to see it if I'm taking too much time or anything. Um, do you think so you could give, sorry, uh, do you think you could give a visual description of yes. this? Yes, absolutely. Um, so yeah, my visual description is I am of Chinese descent. I have long brown hair. I'm wearing a black button down shirt. And behind me, there's a bookshelf with some very messy piles of books. And I have pretty simple slides. I'll try to describe what's on them the best I can. Um, the current slide says Abolish the Tech Industry by Wendy Liu. And there's a picture of the cover of my book, which is called Abolish Silicon Valley, How to Liberate Technology from Capitalism. Uh, yeah, and that's it. And so I will go ahead. Um, so because the session is about the tech industry, the first thing I would like to do for my talk is just 
unpack a little bit what I mean when I say tech industry. And so next slide, which just says abolish the tech industry, but with the last word underlined. So for me, the operative word here is industry, because when I'm thinking about you know, what it means to abolish the tech industry, I'm not really talking about you know, just smashing every computer in the world with a hammer, although that is tempting sometimes, um, but I'm talking about something a little more prosaic, uh, which is related to the mode of production, how technology is produced and distributed, consumed, how decisions about its production are made, and how wealth accumulates to those who happen to own shares of these strange legal structures that we call corporations and not necessarily the people who give their lives away to creating the actual value that these companies trade in. I'm talking about a very particular system of accounting for the ownership of wealth and all the attendant consequences of that on society, on the natural world. So that's what I take issue with in my book and that's what I wanna dig into today. Um, and what that means is this talk, it's not really gonna be like a detailed look in the history of the tech industry or breakdown of what the companies do or what the latest controversies are. I assume people who are in a class like this are already familiar and already have a sense of unease and urgency with regards to these companies that govern increasingly more of the world. Instead, I wanna offer a perspective that is antagonistic to the, the status quo, something of a critical framework through which to understand the tech industry a perspective that is rooted in opposition to the naturalized power structures around us. And I think an abolitionist perspective here is very helpful because it reminds us that everything we think of when we think of the tech industry is contingent. These structures are not natural, they're not eternal. They were created by human beings. And to paraphrase a writer I greatly admire, Ursula K. Le Guin, um, therefore they can be resisted and changed by human beings. That's a thread I hope you can keep in mind throughout this talk and really throughout all, all the work you all do. So for this talk, I'd like to explore an understanding of the tech industry that is rooted in the material conditions of both the industry and society at large, which understands the composition of the industry today as resulting from particular social relations with their own incentives and histories. And the main question I'm trying to address is, where does it all come from? Where did this industry come from? Um, where does it get its power? What are the mechanisms by which it's able to reproduce its power? And of course, there's an important question which follows from that, which unfortunately I won't be able to do justice to in the time that we have, which is, you know, how can all this be challenged? What are the locuses of struggle where power can be resisted and overthrown? A very important question. I'm going to focus on the first question for now and hopefully leave the practical implications to other speakers. All right, so let's talk about where the industry gets its power. I would like to discuss five different lenses that are helpful, I think, for understanding the situation. Um, next slide, which says, understanding where the industry gets its power. And there are five bullet points that say labor, finance, branding, intellectual property, and nature, and in parentheses, free gift. So let's start with the labor relations that characterize the tech industry. And now when I say labor in, associate, in association with the tech industry, you're probably thinking of um, the gig economy, maybe the two tier system for contractors within high tech, tech companies like Google or Apple. Maybe you're thinking of Amazon warehouse workers or drivers. Uh, more broadly, you're probably thinking about the divide between what is typically thought of as productive labor. So the labor that is treated better, the labor that is often given stock options and high salaries and has a lot of freedom and autonomy. And then on the other hand, there's the labor that is undervalued and overworked. And sometimes um, the, so in, in tech, usually, you know, we think of the productive labor, it's the people who have skills that are in demand, often technical, not always, often elite universities, but not always. The specifics vary a lot, but there is definitely a broad pattern of work that is considered to be productive and therefore deserving of better compensation and treatment. And so there's a myth that goes along with this, which is that, you know, some workers are just more productive. They're just more useful. They're smarter. They're more skilled. That's why they deserve to be treated better. That's why they deserve to have more freedom and to have better pay and to be able to advance among the career ladder while other workers are just, you know, less, less capable in some way. And so that's why they're stuck in these jobs that don't pay them very well and are essentially dead end jobs. 
But I think it's worth remembering that capital has always divided workers into those who are deemed essential to production and those who are seen as disposable and interchangeable and containable. And on this subject, I would recommend an essay called The Making of the Tech Worker Movement by Ben Tarnoff. It's in a magazine called Logic Magazine, which I think is amazing, would highly recommend um, for, for more detail on this topic. But I mean, just to summarize, there throughout the history of capitalism, there has always been some sort of justifying mythology to explain the divides that exist among workers, because there always is some sort of divide, right? And usually this divide takes advantage of existing social divisions in terms of race or gender or immigration status. And, and so ultimately it's, it's not a matter of paying people just what they deserve. It's not a matter of saying, oh, this person is better is more intrinsically capable or something, therefore they deserve to be paid better. It's at the end of the day, it's a matter of power. It's a matter of paying workers what um, those in power can get away with and what is useful for whatever they're trying to do. And it's it it's absolutely disconnected from innate worth and you know whatever the myths that are being spread by uh, by capital. There we should completely reject the idea that there is a link between what someone's getting paid and what they are, what they are worth in any, any sense of the word. Um, but I, you know, I do want to acknowledge that there is a part of this mythology that is quite convincing in the sense that there are some people who are able to scale their impact in ways that other people aren't, right? If you take, for example, a software engineer at Amazon, who's able to sometimes create something that can, um, that seems like a whole new product and that creates a new market or whatever, versus, you know, a warehouse worker who's usually only able to operate within fairly um, narrow set of tasks. And so that is true to some degree, but there are some caveats. And one is that this ability to scale is not an innate characteristic. It's a function of the social relations in the workplace. Some people are allowed to share their ideas. Some people are even asked to share their ideas and have them implemented. Other people are, um, they have every single minute of their day timed and made rote and routine. So there is no possibility of them even coming up with any sort of idea. And so that's that's a matter of the, the social relations in the workplace. That's not an innate thing. That's not something we should just take for granted. And the other caveat is that reward does not have to be tied specifically to productivity. Even if we could measure productivity, productivity in isolation and not as part of a web of complex social relations, there's no actual logical justification for that. It doesn't have to be this way. You know, this is a, the idea that it should, that we should tie what someone produces to what they deserve. That's a very strong ideological statement, which presupposes certain things about what people deserve. And I think that's something we should absolutely contest and we should challenge and we should, you know, make clear that this is not something that we need to run a society. Um, but in any case, I think what's interesting about this labor lens is that it's helpful for understanding where the tech industry gets its power from because it's where capital gets its power from. And I don't just mean the companies that are directly exploiting workers like the gig companies or Amazon or you know, Apple. I would also implicate the advertising companies whose profits come essentially from other companies that are underpaying their workers and spending the excess on ads. And this has dire implications, not only on the workers I mentioned before who are underpaid and overworked, but also on those who are theoretically benefiting more from the industry, the so-called productive workers, because then they mm -hmm. end up, even if they're well-paid, they end up spending their limited time on this earth building products that alienate and divide and even kill other people. And so I think that is something something to keep in mind as we, as we go through this talk. So next slide, um, I have highlighted the word finance. Next, I would like to talk about finance. Uh, where does the money come from in the first place? So first I wanna give a really quick primer on venture capital. Um, venture capital firms as, you know, though not, not the only investors in tech companies, but definitely the most significant, think um, Sequoia, Kleiner Perkins, Graycroft, Andreessen Horowitz. If you're in the Bay Area, you probably are very familiar with these names. Many of them are headquartered just, you know, down the peninsula. These are firms whose job it is to invest in startups, sometimes early stage startups, sometimes late stage startups, and they get their money from LPs, which stands for limited partners. And it's their job to invest that money in these high risk ventures, often involving technology, but sometimes just tech branded. And they know that most of their investments will fail, 
But at the same time, if they do their job right, the few that succeed will, you know, 100x, 1000x in value, and that will make up for all the failures. And so that's the, the kind of business model of venture capital. Now, these days, the technology industry is more mature. There's a lot more money rushing in, and it's not just what we think of as traditional venture capital firms. You have hedge funds, private equity, industrial funds, um, you know, rich celebrities, anyone who has like too much money, they're investing in tech startups. It's not new anymore. It's not this like small underdog. It's just the latest gold rush. And anyone with any amount of excess capital is just trying to hit the jackpot. And the latest buzz around um, NFTs, I think is just like a wonderful example of this. You have all these people with extra money pouring it into these things and just thinking like, oh, I'm going to become you know, even more of a billionaire through this. And, and so another way of looking at this is that the tech industry has become firmly ensconced within the circuits of global capital. It's enmeshed with Wall Street. It's enmeshed with all these other powerful players, all these other um, institutions that comprise our economic system. Not only has the tech industry minted many new billionaires, but it also is a way for existing billionaires to keep their money and multiply their money and expand their power and reach into new domains. And it's, yeah, it's not, it's not an upstart. It's not an underdog. Maybe you, there are some like smaller startups that could plausibly claim to be separate from this, but as they get bigger, you know, they grow into the same channels. They help to enrich the same people that they claim to be disrupting. That is just how the industry works. That's how the industry is just so firmly situated within the existing economic system that is very difficult to untangle. And so in other words, the tech industry cannot be separated from the financial interests that are powering it. And those financial interests are increasingly entwined with the financial interests of capitalism at large. And so the next thing I wanna talk about is branding. I've moved to the next slide with the word branding highlighted. Uh, why do tech companies spend so much money on branding? Why do they spend so much money on PR? Well, it's because, I mean, at the end of the day, they want to naturalize themselves. They want to become hegemonic. They want you to think of them as something that's always been there and will always be there, which is weird because these companies are all quite new. I mean, Facebook was founded in 2004. That's within my lifetime, maybe within the lifetimes of many of you. Um, Uber was founded when I was in high school, but these companies act as if they've been around forever because it's good strategy, right? It's, it makes it harder to contest them. and makes it harder to imagine a world where they don't exist. Instead, the bounds of contestation are shrunk to the point of, you know, debating how should we regulate Facebook? You know, should we give them like a board of ethics advisors or should we pass a few laws making it so they can't exploit people that badly or whatever? It's, it just becomes so difficult to imagine a world without them when their names are emblazoned everywhere. You know, the names of their founders have taken over our hospitals and public transit, uh, public transit centers. And so it's hard to imagine a world without them, much less challenge their existence. And so it's all, it's all part of this same system. I mean, it's, um, there's a reason, it's not just tech companies that are doing this, right? It, there's a reason companies sponsor the Super Bowl or the Olympics or put their names on museums or whatever. They just, the ultimate goal, and here I'm paraphrasing from cultural theorist, Mark Fisher, who is uh, one of my inspirations, they want you to think that there is no cultural event or sporting competition or mode for collective joy without capital. You know, that there's no possibility of happiness without Coca-Cola or Bank of America or Chanel brandishing their logo in your face and paying dividends to their shareholders. They want you to get used to a world uh, where logos are everywhere and brands are everywhere and every square inch of the world is commodified. And in order to have any experience or to ha have any connection with someone, you have to swipe a credit card or do a transaction on the blockchain. I think this is something that tech companies did not invent, but they are very much profiting from and they're taking advantage of. And so I think the reason this is something we should be concerned about is because, I mean, this, it ultimately comes down to the problems of the corporate form. You know, the, the corporate form that comprises the modern tech industry has certain assumptions. What to a private corporation is a human life? What is the point of caring about people who are suffering? Those are not figures on a balance sheet, so they don't matter. The things that we as human beings find valuable and irreplaceable are things that don't matter to these companies. 
you know, Uber doesn't, doesn't care if its drivers have to sleep in cars unless, you know, there's some sort of PR backlash and customers revolt. Like Amazon doesn't care if warehouse workers are, um, you know, just like just dying on the job unless it actually has any sort of financial impact on them. And these legal, these, these corporations, these legal fictions, they're shells that make it so they legally don't have to care. Their directors have a fiduciary responsibility to shareholders' right to perpetual growth. Nothing else. That's, that's it. That's by design. That is the impressive thing about capital. That's what has allowed um, capital to accumulate to the point that it has. But it's also the reason that capital is killing us. It's the reason that it's destroying so many of the things that we love and need to survive. And so the next slide I've highlighted intellectual property. This sounds like a minor technical point, but in a way it's the most important. I think one useful way of thinking about the tech industry is as an agglomeration of companies that are really good at taking the intellectual property um, that is the creative output of many people, some of them employ employed by the company, some of them not, and turning it into gold, essentially. They're basically milking their legal right to capture the creative output of society, whether in the form of scientific knowledge or building products or creating art, and they're turning that into cash. At the same time, they're also monopolizing certain things that we should think of as natural resources. Um, I think we're running a little low on time here, so I don't think I have time to tell the story, but I do want to recommend that people look up the story of the .co TLD, which is, you know, um, if you've been on Twitter and seen like a, like a shortened link, like t.co, well, the .co TLD is the Columbia, the, the Colombian CLD, uh, TLD. So it's like the country of Colombia is supposed to own .co. It no longer does. And that is a story for another day, but I think it is an illustrative example of how certain things that we should think of as natural resources are instead owned by you know, billion dollar corporations. And most of them headquartered in America. In this case, .co is now owned by a private equity firm called Golden Gate Capital. I think the story for that is, is highly interesting. I would absolutely recommend people look, look into it. Um, and then, you know, other things that we should think of as natural resources in the digital space are, um, other than domain names are, you know, think about your, your phone and how you probably, have to use an app store to access an apps, to, to download any apps. Who controls what apps are allowed? Who controls the payment structure of these apps? It's not you, you have no say over it. It's the policies, the, the rules governing these, these are all designed by companies that you really have no way of contesting. And I think another, um, another thing to think about here is payments of infrastructure. I mean, just the sheer number of private companies that are inserted anytime you want to pay for something other than cash. And if you've, you know, if you spend any amount of time on an e-commerce website, you've probably seen ads for Affirm or Klarna or Sezzle or Afterpay, all these um, loan companies that make it so that every time you want to buy something, you know, there's like an, another intermediary so that you can spread out your payments over multiple transactions. I think it's important to, to remember that these are all part of this um, financial technological infrastructure whose goal it is to make you spend more money, is to make you consume more, and it is to take a cut of the pie every time there's a transaction. And uh, next slide, I've highlighted nature, free gift. So the last lens I want to discuss is that of nature. Um, capital has always treated nature as a free gift. This is something that Marx famously said. And I think the tech industry is no exception. If we, there's just so many ways to think about how this is true, but I mean, some basic examples are the minerals that need to be mined to produce the hardware that we have, the electricity that's needed to power the servers, the gasoline that powers the Amazon trucks, the diesel that powers container ships. It's all taken for granted. It's all just part of the fabric of modern day capitalism. And a key part of this fabric has to do with our reliance on global supply chains. And in recent years, we've seen evidence that these supply chains are not as robust as maybe people used to think they were. The pandemic, um, worker uprisings, even things like a boat being stuck in a canal, these have all indicated that these supply chains are not just this, this free gift of nature that we should take for granted. But at the same time, a lot of companies have managed to become incredibly wealthy and powerful on the back of this global supply chain where you know, for a pretty long period of time, there was relative stability. 
um, someone like Amazon could count on these supply chains where you could take advantage of cheap products manufactured in the global south and then sell them to wealthier consumers in the global global north. I mean, this is something that many corporations were able to get wealthy off of. And I think that's something we should remember. We should see it as kind of a strange thing, just treating nature as this free gift and not doing anything to ensure that it is sustained or cultivated. Oh, sorry. So lastly, I just want to tie all these strands together and give a macro picture of why the tech industry is so important right now. So the labor strand. Labor is weak in varying degrees around the globe, which means that companies are able to profit from exploiting workers or just exploiting their consumption and raising their cost of living. So you can make a lot of profit from that. And then on the other hand, the few good jobs that do exist at these companies are in demand because you know, the alternative is often pretty bad. And so there are people who are willing to do these jobs, even if they know that these jobs are not fulfilling, even if they, they know that these jobs are making the world worse, um, because it's a matter of self-preservation. The alternative is quite precarious. And then the financial strand is that uh, capital is concentrated, inequality is high. There have been a lot of changes to financial regulation in the last few decades. You have a lot of surplus capital that's just sloshing around, looking for a place to go. Tech looks like a pretty good investment. It's already produced a lot of billionaires, and um, it feels, you know, it feels like something that could actually continue to go up forever. Unlike, say, the last, um, the last financial bubble, which was in Wall Street and which burst and made people distrust Wall Street to some degree. And so you have all this money that comes from sovereign wealth funds, for example, in the case of Saudi Arabia, which was a big investor in SoftBank, which funded Uber and WeWork and other companies like that. Um, we're talking about uh, oil money there. That's, you know, speaking of free gifts of nature. You also have pension funds now that such things are often financialized and defined benefit rather than defined contribution. Apologies if I'm going too quickly here. I think I'm just running low on time. Um, you also have university endowment funds, which is a whole other story of elite universities as a mechanism for reproducing the elite as a class. You have um, wealthy families like the Waltons who uh, owned Walmart and co companies like Google with excess capital just hoarded from underpaying workers and scraping off the top of these transactions. Basically, the long story short is you have all this money that comes from exploiting people at the end of the day. And it's just trying to make a return. So it goes into tech a lot of the time. It goes into any startup that can promise some sort of technology or at least you know, some way of getting a piece of the market. And then the branding aspect is that the money that is spent on marketing and uh, brand awareness, it is conditioning us all to see capital as natural, as desirable, you know, like why? Why do you hate efficiency? Like, if you don't like tech, why don't you feel emo emotionally stirred by these ads about connecting people, making the world a better place? Don't you feel nostalgia when you see, you know, Sesame Street characters promoting DoorDash or your favorite celebrity telling you to order from Uber Eats? Doesn't it make you want to overlook the fact that they're working with the U.S. military or treating their workers horribly or building pro products that harm people? or profiting off a global system of production, which requires unsustainably increasing production. So it, it works very, very effectively. Um, and then the last, the last part is, um, or sorry, the second to last part is IP, you know, the real source of their wealth and power. They control it. They're taking all this, the creative output of all these people around the world. And they're saying, we own this, it's ours. We have the right to determine what happens to it. We have the right to profit from it. And I'll grant that there's a certain amount of um, temptation to believe in technocracy, to assume that because these people are experts in something that they know what they're doing. But I mean, just because they're experts in some technical things doesn't mean they care about you. That doesn't mean they care about the same things you do. It doesn't mean they have any idea of what it's like for most of the people who are relying on their products or that they care even a little bit about what they want. And there are no mechanisms for contesting that. It's all locked up within these companies, which are which have built their fiefdoms on unilateral control over intellectual property, which is you know, backed by these international trade agreements. And then lastly, we have free gifts of nature, which is a point that I feel like is ex exceptionally salient now because we are in the middle of COP26, the United Nations Climate Change Conference, which feels like an absolute farce for a number of reasons. Our planet is burning, our ecosystems are being destroyed our futures are being foreclosed and our institutions are utterly, utterly inca incapable of facing up to this challenge. 
And, you know, the tech industry, it's not responsible for this problem, seeing as it's a modern outgrowth of a much larger system. But at the same time, these companies have all gotten rich off the system. They are, you know, parasitical on the system. They're profiting from advertising. They're profiting from consumption. They're profiting from destroying the, the natural world in exchange for boosting some company stock prices. And they're all aspiring to continue to profit from the system. Whatever their initial rhetoric may have been about challenging the powerful or whatever, they're not, they're not doing that. They're at best, they're dethroning existing players to take their place and profit off the same structures. And you know, at the bottom, we we have this vampiric capitalist system which sucks up the natural world and turns it into sand. And the tech industry in its current form, I would say it presupposes a particular relationship between humanity and the natural world, which is antagonistic and which uses up and exploits and destroys and is not tenable anymore. I mean, it never really was, but definitely now when we're in the middle of an ecological crisis, it is absolutely not something we should countenance. And so this is my last slide. Um, I just wanna summarize my talk by saying the tech industry is what you get when capital is powerful and labor is weak. That means is, you know, when capital is powerful, it can privatize the, the commons. It can privatize the creative output of humanity and call that the tech industry. It can use that to, you know, sell back to humanity as a subscription service or just um, lock up as intellectual property and just like keep boosting its stock price forever. It can take an alienated, unhappy population and promise them commodities to make them feel better. It can, it can take people's housing and turn that into commodities to be rented out on platforms. It can commodify every square inch of our world and make us grateful for the crumbs that it throws back at us. And I think what we need now when we're thinking about abolishing the tech industry, when we're thinking about a world without the tech industry as it exists now, is we need a shift in the balance of power away from these ossified structures of capital and the all the other institutions that buttress them. And I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I am inspired by modern social movements of labor organizing, you know, workers taking action both within unions and without. I'm excited by tenant organizing, by community organizing, challenging corporations, um, people taking matters into their own hands to challenge racism and sexism and other things that divide people. And it sounds a little strange because this feels disconnected from tech, but that is what I mean by abolishing the tech industry. I mean, you know, reimagining a world without the cold logic of capital undergirding every transaction. I want to live in a world that is characterized by real abundance, not artificial scarcity. I want to live in a world characterized by love and joy and meaningful connection, not alienating commercial transactions. I want to live in a world that is sustainable in the long term, not characterized by some scorched earth policy of taking all these free gifts of nature and then leaving future generations to rot. I want a world where everyone can live a decent life, not a world where some people live in mansions and other people live in tents. So that's what I want. And I don't think the tech industry in its current form will allow that because I think it's built on the foundations of an economic system that embraces exactly the opposite. And that's not unique to the tech industry. That's not specific just to tech companies, but as an outgrowth of this larger system, I think the tech industry as we know it now, it will have to go. I mean, it just, it just doesn't work. It doesn't make any sense. None of this is sustainable. It's all built on sand. And I think we really need to figure out alternative ways of building the things that we need to thrive as a society without these monstrous corporations capturing every single bit of it and, and exploiting workers and you know paying our favorite celebrities to appear in ads to convince us that we should be happy about it. So that's where I want to leave it. Um, thank you so much to, for listening and I look forward to questions. Thank you so much, Wendy. Um, we're going to have questions towards the end of the session tonight. So if people um, have questions for Wendy, please write them down. Um, and you can put them in the chat, we can save them for later or just have them ready to go. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for your presentation and bringing up so many powerful facts um, and disturbing and heartbreaking facts too about the tech industrial complex um, and what we can do to learn more to help empower ourselves to 
abolish the tech industry. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. I'm gonna pass it to Charlie to introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Um, so I am now super excited to introduce Ria Kaluri, um, who is a queer South Asian human studying the ideas and values embedded in AI, artificial intelligence, and the ways in which current AI concentrates power. She's also an organizer with the grassroots abolitionist group Defund SFPD Now, she aspires to continue being a small part in the networks of humans challenging current AI, as well as our networks of, of humans creating radical community care. Things that make her happy are math at midnight and painting with her people. But, um, thank you so much for being with us, Ria. Thank you. Yeah, it's wonderful to be here. Um, Y'all, your co-organizers are so cool. They're wonderful people. I'm so happy to be here. Um, yeah, I, uh, I work and study um, at the intersection of studying these modern technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning and these are their names that actually just kind of are often just covers for the same technology that have always been around, um, but they're kind of flashy now. And uh, this sometimes goes like that intersection with, you know, thinking about abolition and technology. Um, some of my peers and I think about this as the intersection of radical and AI, where radical plus AI is an approach to exposing how AI rearranges power and dreaming up and building human slash AI systems that put power in the hands of the people. So these are the aspirations of me and a lot of people I love. Um, it's, there are Right, this critical question again and again is just like coming back to this word power, because I think that that's, it's really easy to lose the word power in technology conversations, because there's just so many other conversations, there's so many other um, like terms and systems, and the systems are like institutional, and sometimes they're companies, and sometimes they're universities, and they're tied into police, right? And so I think the, the thread that you want to ask yourself every time you interact with any of these technologies um, is how is this technology shifting power? And uh, as, as Wendy referenced some of these, um, just every piece of the technology pipeline is deeply intertwined with shifting power to the center and away from these beautiful communities at the margins. Um, this is people often forget the hardware right now that people have like invented this term cloud so that no one thinks of it as land, right? Like that's an attempt to like sort of extract land and turn it into this conversation about something that, you know, isn't really extraction, right? But of course it is. It's about extracting minerals and technologies, usually from countries in the global south, um, extracting uh, like labor from folks around the world, um, often for very meager pay. There's a beautiful essay called Anatomy of AI on this, just like sort of paints this picture of the different places. Um, it's also about the way technology shifts power is like technology is surveillance currently, right? It is policing. And sometimes it's easy to like say it's a metaphor, right? Like, oh, technology is like the prison and we should think of it. No, like technology is policing in a lot of our uh, cities, like land areas, even now. Um, Stop LAPD spying does a really good job of pointing this out. But um, yeah, te technology, AI are just systems that input data, right? Data is another word like cloud. Usually it represents datafied peoples <laughs> who did not consent to being datafied um, and it outputs information, right? So what is that? These models called AI, if they input data about datafied peoples and they extract information and then give it to people who have the resources to pay for that information, either because they're a company or a large scale or a, a large scale government, um, of course, that is surveillance, right? <laughs> like that's not just an analogy for surveillance. Um, so yeah, there's, there's all of these ways that AI shifts power to the center. This happens uh, in all the way into like, not just uh, corporately, um, but also, <laughs> um, also in like in universities, it's sort of fascinating when you uh, like I read these research papers by all of these computer science and AI people, and my friends and I did one reading where we just read like a hundred of the top papers in this discipline of AI machine learning, 
um, and highlighted every value word that was used. And it's, it's both wild how everyone just uses the same values, right? Everyone says like, oh, we want large scale models that, um, that can create, that are like controllable by the people who are paying for the model that, uh, right, like all of these things. And one really interesting thing to me is that they use this word efficiency a lot, right? We value efficiency. And some people think like, oh, don't, don't you like that value, right? Like that, that maybe supports like um, more people using it for lower resources. But if you highlight every instance of efficiency and every instance of valuing um, AI that works with low resources, there is almost no overlap. Right? So efficiency isn't actually being used in this value, even though they sort of get to claim that it is in a lot of these papers. Um, so it's just really worthwhile um, to notice this shifting of power um, all the way from the extraction of, uh, of physical um, items to within the, like in these police departments by these governments, all the way to research who are working on this to feed it back into this uh, policing. Um, and I think within that, uh, it is really hard to be hopeful. And I think hope is a discipline and trying to dream up, right? This idea that like technology isn't defined as what computers like currently are today. Um, technology, right? Like books are technology. And despite being uh, sort of in this elite white, uh, like white ivory tower, for years and years and feeling like this thing that was sort of um, like defined and censored by, you know, these like white straight men, usually colonial men, right? Um, like books are not that to us anymore. Books are this deeply democratizing um, technology that I don't know, like connected me to some of my, you know, my idols in life, um, abolitionist organizers and poets. Um, yeah, so that's my few statements about the, the, this key, these key sort of things to kind of push ourselves to ask all the time, which is one, how does this technology shift power? And two, how can I sort of practice hope as a discipline? Um, it's my attempt to summarize some of the beautiful things I work on and some of the really angering things I work on. And I would love to take any questions, literally anything you ask, I'm happy to answer. Wonderful. Um, so we, um, the way that we typically structure these is we um, have the questions towards um, the end. So that will be after our next speaker. But in the meantime, I will pass it back to Alex to introduce the break. And yes, thank you so much, Ria, for sharing your wisdom with us. I, you, I learned so much. I, you know, I didn't even think about like the the books as technology thing, like ever, until you pointed it out. So. Thank you for, you know, like totally, totally shifting my mind frame on that. Yeah, thank you, Rhea. Um, and thank you, Charlie. We're going to take a 10 minute break, um, which will be followed by Cecia Dominguez Lopez from Color Coded Collective. And we'll also include the discussion question that will be explored in our breakout rooms at 740 in case folks want to reflect on it ahead of time. Um, and so right now is 6.53, we will be back at 7.03. Have fun.
Welcome back everyone from the break. Um, I'm gonna pass it to Charlie to introduce our last speaker for the night. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, I am super excited to introduce Cecia Dominguez, uh, Cecia Dominguez Lopez rather, um, who uses ella, she, or they pronouns um, and is a facilitator, designer, cultural, yeah, facilitator, designer, and cultural worker striving for our collective liberation. Through many modalities, they explore, they explore historical legacies of healing to cultivate and nourish ecologies of care that center the health and dignity of Black and Indigenous communities. Through embodied practice, they primarily work with organizers, movement-based organizations, and other frontline communities impacted by state and border violence. Color Coded Collective are a POC only transformative space that centers historically excluded people in the co-teaching, co-creation and co-ownership of new technologies. Their work supports and amplifies groups and individuals who are uplifting and sustaining communities of color in Los Angeles and beyond. Together, they advance sustainable community centric projects to stay lifelong learners, protect families, defend neighborhoods, decolonize, indigenize, liberate, grow collective wealth and thrive. Thank you so much for joining us, Cecia. Thank you, buenas noches, everyone. Thanks for the introduction, Charlie and Alex and all the organizers um, for tonight organizing and for the invitation. Happy to be here. Um, before going into um, sharing a little bit, I think about I have about 15, 10 minutes to share about um, some of the work that we're doing. Um, but before going into that, did want to share my visual description first. Um, so I am a darker toned Illegal Zapoteca femme. I have black wavy hair pulled half back into a high ponytail. Um, I have a double nose piercing with two gold hoops on my left nostril that caused a lot of escándalo in my pastor's daughter up, upbringing. Um, I'm wearing silver aviator frame glasses, teardrop crystal earrings, and a golden chain for Cecia and Seferina, who is my grandmother on my mom's side. Um, I'm wearing a long sleeved white and black checkered button down that is open with a black shirt underneath. And in the background, you'll see all my beautiful housemates, um, also known as my plants. Um, so yeah, thank you all for, for sharing. Um, also, just to add a little bit um, about who I am, I also just wanted to shout out um, all the collective bodies that have shaped me um, the same way that a lot of our world shapes us and technologies around us shape us. Um, so have the, um, you know, a lot of the mountains, shout outs to the Rocky Mountain Range in Salt Lake City, Utah that has shaped a lot of me. Shout outs to the mountains in Oaxaca, um, where my, my family um, have lived, my lineage has lived in those valleys and shout outs to the Pacific Ocean, um, which is nearby um, where I'm based, um, saying saludos from Tongva land, AKA Los Angeles territory. Um, so yeah, I won't get too much into um, how we see carceral technologies and um, you know why we want to abolish the tech world um, at Color Coded um, because our wonderful speakers beforehand I think did a wonderful job of kind of laying out a lot of the contradictions or challenges right that we're facing um, but I did want to share a little bit of the birth story of Color Coded and, and how that led us to um, explore what we're, um, explore art as an abolition technology, um, something that I'm very focused on and excited um, right now in my life. So um, for us, I think um, Color Coded came together because, you know, for us, tech is not neutral in the same way that our world design is not neutral, right? Like our speakers before said, um, this world has been shaped by humans and can continue to be shaped by humans, right? And for a lot of us, these stories, um, the, the, the logic or the values or the views that shape our current world design are very old stories, right? Stories that come, um, a lot of them birthed out of the enlightenment era. Um, and then a lot of them exported worldwide by cis, um, straight, wealthy men who are mostly Christian and from Eastern Europe, 
um, and that was over, you know, if we're, we're not, we're, we need to go back way longer than 500 years ago, we need to go back longer than like a thousand years ago to really understand where these stories come from. Um, so for us, um, why, is, why is thinking about our world design, right? Why is thinking about how the world is shaped important for us? Um, because that's what technology is, right? Technology, um, the, the textbook definition or like the, you know, dictionary Merriam-Webster definition for um, technology is really just a set of practices or a set of knowledge around a specific topic or a specific theme. Um, so for us, that kind of led us to develop our carceral technology definition um, that basically states, um, let me pull it up. So for us, carceral technology means the use of knowledge and intentional practices towards the domination, control, and surveillance of bodies, hearts, and minds. Um, so again, we you know, attribute the carceral technologies, this worldview that we live in um, to whiteness and um, systems of domination that this logic of whiteness, um, my shorthand for it being, you know, um, the systems of domination, meaning like capitalism, patriarchy, ableism, citizenship, borders, all of that, right? Um, rather than saying systems of domination every time, I just say whiteness. Um, but again, really, cla really claiming that these are old stories that came from um, Eastern European men, right? And for us, we want to expand the our definition of technology, right? For, and because this world designed is made to feel, um, was exported a long time ago, right? It like, like our speaker said previously, it feels very natural. It feels like it's the way it's always been. It feels like the, it's the way that it should always be. Um, but also wanting to uplift that outside of Western framework, there are lots of technologies um, that don't get accounted for and don't get respected and don't get valued, right? So um, we uh, Ria talked earlier about books as an analog technology. And for us, you know, I have a friend that talks a lot about abuelita technologies, right? So all the knowledges and stories um, and medicine that is passed down by our abuelitas is, is a technology. Um, and I invite folks to kind of share um, any other ancestral technologies that might be coming up for them as they're kind of reframing, um, yeah, what technology can mean outside of a Western concept of, of what gets valued, what ideas, what worldviews get seen as important and, and get prioritized, right? Um, so, so for us, then what does it mean to do abolition technology, right? What does it mean to practice um, creating technologies that center um, that center care, that center systems and a worldview um, for the health of all bodies, hearts and minds, not just the bodies of these um, white cis, you know, European straight men. Um, and I also wanted to point out that uh, our our working definitions of carceral technology and abolition technology. Um, have been co-created in community um, between a collaboration between Color Coded and Stop LAPD Spying, which we had shouted out earlier, based here in LA. Um, and yeah, we are we're um, interested in kind of uplifting what what do, what technologies do we want to see? What kinds of knowledges do we want to center that get us to a world design um, centered on care and um, love, right, for each other, not just for um, the people that we wanted that we want to protect um, in 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 our current design again that being the closer you are to a white cis wealthy straight male Christian male the more um, care you might have in this world. Um, so within that space, um, we've been trying we've been practicing like how how do we these stories can be really old right. Uh, we're talking about over 500 years, um, over a thousand years of these stories being explored as worldwide. And that can be really overwhelming, right? And it can be really messy as well. None of us have lived outside of colonization. None of us have lived out of this current world design. So we also embody those, um, those practices. We also embody whiteness, no matter what the color of your skin is, right? So how do we create spaces um, where we can create, when we can start living in the world that we want to see, this world, many worlds centered around um, love and care, um, 
even if our outside infrastructure doesn't quite match that. Um, and for that, I also wanted to shout out um, Los Zapatistas for folks that don't know um, their concept of un mundo donde quepan muchos mundos. So many, a world where many worlds fit, right? So we also know that um, as, folk, as abolitionists, as folks who are trying to create new world designs, um, we don't know what's best for everyone, right? And what might be best for me and my collective bodies might be different um, depending on the context, depending on who, um, who else is in my environment, right? Um, so a world where many worlds fit, a world where we can, a many worlds centered around care um, and love is, you know, some of the uh, explorations that we've been doing through our Embody Abolition Build Many World Space. Um, and what else did I want to say here? Yeah, I guess that because these um, stories can feel so old, because they can be messy, because we are humans that embody whiteness, because we um, embody these technologies as well, how do we create spaces where we can, you know, hear each other, see each other, and really um, make space and, and have the tools that we need to create these different worlds? So. For us, um, using art as an abolition technology has kind of been a pathway to explore some of those concepts for us. Um, and I'll share a short story um, just around, you know, the use of art um, and art as an abolition technology for the sake of time. But for me, I think one thing um, that was one thing that was really impacting and, and drove me to really explore what is what are these carceral technologies, what are these abolition technologies, and um, how do we get them now rather than later, um, was when my sibling was incarcerated, and my little brother, um, you know, my little brother being incarcerated really impacted our entire family, right? So, even though he was the one inside. Um, the collective bodies around him, aka my mother, myself, my other siblings were also impacted. And for a long time, you know, we would just go visit him, do the things we need to do, keep on living our lives, go to the courts, do the things. Um, but we weren't really talking to each other about the impact that that was having on our, you know, minds, bodies, souls, um, our energetic bodies, our spiritual bodies. And we just weren't having those conversations. And, you know, I'm someone that likes to talk. I like to make art. I like to explore things. But those were just like themes that I wasn't sure how to, how to engage my family with. And also um, these, again, how these carceral technologies impact us can be very personal and can be very heavy. Um, so I didn't quite have the language to meet my family where they were at without, because I was just so angry at this current world design. So it wasn't until I started an art project um, where I decided to interview my family members and really just think about like, what is, what is health for our bodies? What is health for our collective bodies look like? Um, and start, um, started making, you know, an art project that came out of that, which was um, eventually these like healing, what I was calling healing stations, which were just um, gardens full of different medicinal plants um, and really where I got to really explore different plant technologies and how the energetic and physical properties of plants and the technologies within plants can um, help support us as we're trying to envision these worlds of care. Um, so all of that to say that, you know, this work can be personal um, and this work can be heavy and we might have a lot of rage and feelings about it. But I also believe that we're not going to be able to build these many worlds of care that we want to see if we're not coming from an embodied and grounded place, if we're not coming from a place of imagination and creativity and pleasure and play. Um, and we know that trauma has an impact on our imagination. We know that, you know, whiteness in this world design impacts us. And I don't want to design the new world that I want to see from that place, from that reactionary place. I want to be able to um, design and create the technologies that we need for these different worlds from a place of imagination, a place of care, a place of love. So um, really practicing, again, how do we embody some of these abolitionist technologies, how do we um, infuse play and creativity into that process is, is really important in, in the work that we're doing and exploring. Um, so 
I'm thankful that, you know, we have a space where we can explore what that looks like for us and explore in, um, in community as well. Um, and most importantly, also put it into practice, right? We're not just about designing um, and thinking about these things, but also building those worlds that we want to see. So I think I'm at time now, so I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciated the wisdom and the perspective and the care that you've shown with us. And I also personally really appreciate um, the way that you referenced, you know, like collective bodies and things that are not normally considered like technology, quote unquote. Um, and so, you know, I just thank you for, for joining us and I have learned like so much. And I will pass it uh, back to Alex to introduce the Q&A. Thank you. And thank you, Cecilia. That was so beautiful what you shared. And um, yeah, I'm like, I just want to burn shit down and, and uh, grow a bunch of herbs with everybody now. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're going to go into our Q&A. And, &A and um, we'll do a 10-minute Q&A for BIPOC class members. Um, BIPOC's BIPOC folks, please raise your hand if you'd like to ask any questions or type something in the chat to let us know if you'd like to speak um, or that you'd like to have your question read aloud for you. We'll open up questions from everyone in the last five minutes. After the Q&A, we'll go into breakout room discussions. And please remember to send a message to the person marked as host to let them know if you're a white person so that we can arrange the rooms accordingly. Um, but first, we'll start with the question that we'll ask our presenters. Um, so in your wildest dreams, how do you imagine us creating an abolitionist world? And how does this overlap with CCSF? And I'll drop it in the chat if it's not already there. And anyone who would like to go first, please feel free to do so. Yeah, I was going to say, I guess I can jump in. Um, yeah, I think I shared a little bit about, um, you know, I think for me, um, if we don't have pleasure, if we don't have play, if we don't have ways to really tap into what we desire in this world, um, I'm not, I'm not sure where, I'm not sure how far we're going to get. So I think for me, having an embodied approach um, to the world that we want to live in is really important. Um, and one thing that I'll add that Um, so I just appreciate that um, y'all are putting some of, you know, that theory into practice and sometimes it can be uncomfortable, right? Again, we're, we're, we're all shaped by these systems of domination and that can get messy. Um, it can get uncomfortable. It can be not cute at times. Um, but working through it and setting a container where we can talk through that um, is important to me. So shout out to y'all for, you know, um, BIPOC to the front and putting these things into practice that sometimes make um, folks uncomfortable or sometimes make um, spaces uncomfortable for certain people, especially if they're not used to, um, you know, interrogating their own power dynamics that are at play. So yeah, I'll stop there. Uh, yeah, I, I love a lot of those words um, so much, and I'm sure I'll echo some of them in what I say. Um, I feel like 
when I think about abolition, I think about, right, the, the Angela Davis quote, right, like radical is grasping at the roots. I think of some of these other people um, who have really, who've really clearly said that abolition and radical work is about seeing the, the seed of everything, right? Like the thing underneath it, the roots underneath it, um, and, and asking like what those roots are now and what roots you want to be building on top of. Um, and usually I feel like when I get asked questions like this around what I want to like ask everyone to do, what I want to ask myself to do as like an abolitionist way of being, I feel like I say the critique the world first usually and say the care second for some reason. And I actually feel inclined to say this in the opposite order today. Um, where I think uh, building an abolitionist world for me, and this is so many words that you just shared, um, is like pleasure in play, right? It's like dancing at the margins. It's our communities at the margins, being in spaces together, being in circles together, um, getting to, to just take care of our bodies, take care of each other's bodies, um, to be like, it's so interesting that you just said that because I like the first time I thought about intimacy and technology I like had and I was just about to share this in the chat um I thought of the exact same thing I was like the first time I thought of truly creating intimate technology for myself and like putting those words together um I wrote a paragraph for myself about how I wanted to create this like beautiful vision um and at the time I wanted to make it digital just to like feel like I had some intimacy with this technology of just like all of my ancestral flowers, right? Of like my parents' parents' relationship with like Jasmine and Bogan villages spread across the floor. Um, and that, that to me is part of creating these, this deep sense of care and pleasure and embodiment and slowness. I think that's huge to me. It's, it's really easy to get caught in like an urgency model, but there are some amazing quotes including by folks uh, by Black Panthers that say like, this, this isn't like a struggle of today, right? Like you, this isn't your struggle of today. Like you are part of this long lineage and, and you don't need to do the urgency. Like it doesn't, it doesn't save you. Um, so I think to me, that is, a, that is like all wrapped up in abolition. And one crucial piece of that is naming, it requires running experiments. And that is like really hard to internalize because an experiment means like you're gonna get it wrong a lot. Like, right, an experiment means that when you try to communicate, like create this community of care and you try to share your feelings, right, in this space, you're gonna do it in a way that sometimes like doesn't actually support everyone in the space and you have to try again, right? And you, you might like try to interact with technology and make it intimate in this way and then realize the technology you created like relied on, and some resources that you didn't know about and you have to go back and like dig further, right? So there's all these experiments you have to run um, to try to connect with one another, to try to create these like these abolitionist worlds. Um, and I think from that, I will say the thing I usually say first, which is from that place of care and love and pleasure, we step into critique, we move into critique, right? Like we knowing what we, roots we want to have, we can look at the roots that exist, right? Knowing we want to dance at the margins, right? And like, be super honest, like what does dancing look like to you? I said at the beginning, like math at midnight, painting with my friends, like writing poetry in my spaces, like those are part of what, um, like my abolition and my roots and dancing at the margins is to me as is like community building and uh, like defund organizing, right? Ab abolition organizing. Um, and from that space, I can see that like, the way AI works right now, the way technology works right now, like those are not the roots I want, right? Like those shift power exclusively to the center every moment of every day. And it becomes a lot easier to like, to critique those, to challenge them, to organize your labor against them, to like point them out and uh, to either your friends, right? Like that's already doing abolitionist work and like to the powers at B. And you get to do that critique again and again because you know where you're organizing from. And, and that's, I think, where like hopeful anger comes from is your anger is like deeply rooted in this care. And um, yeah, and I think like 
I, I say all that feeling like this is exactly the kind of space that tries to embody those things, right? That it says like, this is the space that we want to create. And from that place, like, let's talk about abolishing tech. Let's talk about abolishing these other systems. Let's talk, to, let's talk about um, abolishing like these uh, just, I, I'm not, I don't even remember the word I was trying to say. Um, but yeah, like from this place of also talking about mutual aid and community care and running these experiments. I love that you're all running these experiments of like, how do we center BIPOC in this space? Like, let's try four experiments and it'll be different next time you run this course, I'm sure. Um, so yeah, all of that to me is creating an abolitionist world. And I definitely see that in this space. And I appreciate this moment to be part of that. That, that was really beautiful. Um, thank, yeah, I really appreciate what both the previous speakers have said. I think what I would add is like, you know, once, like after having prioritized care and like trying to build something positive, I think what abolition means or like what building an abolitionist world means to me is um, being rebellious. It's realizing that to sustain the things that you care about, to sustain the things you love and bring you joy, it will require fighting. It will require resisting the forces that are conspiring to prevent you from having joy. And it will require a certain amount of rebellion and just not going along the beaten path of doing something different, learning from history, but also um, you know, adjusting for the moment and trying to come up with new innovative ways of saying no and refusing to go along with these like outside forces that are going to try to deprive you of the things that make you happy and of uh, connection and um, any sort of like meaning you're able to find in life because they want you to be uh, a worker. They want you to be, you know, a tenant who is being dispossessed by your landlord. Like there are so many forces that are conspiring to prevent you from finding joy in the way that you want. And I think it's, you know, once you've gone to that place of care, once you've gone to a place where you're able to fight, I think it's important to, yeah, to figure out what that fight should look like. Um, because, and I think CCSF is just so crucial here because I mean, to me, what CCSF is doing with this program and probably with other programs is that it's training people to think critically. It's giving them this like very critical perspective from which to understand the problems with the world as it is now and also to give them these like glimpses of something better and avenues of resistance that they can join, these like organizing efforts that they can join. Um, and I think ultimately what it comes down to um, in terms of what I'm, what I feel like CCSF is doing and what I feel like is necessary for building an abolition, abolitionist world is a combination of moral clarity and having a, a strategic vision. And the moral clarity is, I mean, that's how you know something is bad. And that's, that should be at the heart of it. That should be, um, that's kind of like what I mean by what I interpret care as. It's just like knowing, you know, what is good? What do you value? What do you want more of in the world? And knowing what is bad, what is something you need to stop. But also, I mean, the morality on its own is not enough because the people who are benefiting from the current system don't care about your morality. They don't care what is good. They don't care what is bad. They simply want to continue the system that benefits them. And so they will have to be defeated using whatever points of leverage are at your disposal. And that's where the strategy comes in. Um, that's why it's important to understand the mechanisms by which these systems are reproduced in order to figure out how to jam them. And so you need, I think, to build an abolitionist world, you need a combination of this like this feeling of love and care and morality, and also a sense of um, what to do about it. You know, what are the what are the structures? What do they look like? What are the like the points of leverage through which they can be disrupted? And so that yeah, that to me seems like it, it seems like CSS, CCSF is doing very well. And I think this program, this whole building abolition course is just like a fantastic example of that. And I'm very, very happy to be, to be part of it. Thank you all for your amazing questions. Two brief notes. One, um, we have another question um, in the chat that I believe Baldwin will be reading out loud. And then second, we are um, brief also from here briefly opening up um, the questions uh, Q&A to everyone. Um, if anyone has questions, please feel free to raise your hand or let us know in the chat and that we will be um, starting to wrap up in just a couple of minutes. So the next question or two will probably be the last one.
sorry, um, Baldwin will not be reading it aloud himself, so I will read it for you. Um, yeah, no worries, Baldwin. Um, let me just scroll back to it. Um, so this is a question from Baldwin um, to everyone um, or to anyone who feels called to answer. Um, it's a two-parter. First, how do you feel about market reform versus organizing outside of the market? And how do you think either slash both methods impact economic or social material conditions? And then size intersectionality, class, and solidarity in your own way to achieve your goals in the abolition of the unethical market. And I will put this back in the uh, chat so you don't have to scroll up for it. Um, I can share. I can start by sharing really quickly. Um, so how do you feel about market reform? So I think for me, this brings me back to like inside outside strategies and organizing, right? Um, we're color coded. We are a tech collective that decided to not speak to the tech industry, right? So and to not um, feed into the um, tech talent pipeline or whatever it is. Right. So um, for us, I think, I mean, it, all strategies are needed. Um, and I think depending, again, on where you come from and what role you might have in this world, um, you know, that can those are questions that maybe you can reflect on for yourself in terms of like, where is my position? Where where can I be more strategic with my positionality? Right. Um, some of the questions that we ask ourselves um, in our um, respectful technologies framework is, um, you know, am I being respectful and honorable to myself as, as I'm engaging in this work? Am I um, reflecting on the power dynamics at play? Am I um, shifting power as I'm doing this work? Should Are those people in the space? How might this work impact bodies seven generations down the line, not just myself, right? So um, those are questions that I kind of use to kind to assess like what pro what kinds of projects am I building? What kind of projects am I investing my energy in? Um, and in terms of again intersectionality, class and solidarity, um, again all of these questions around really interrogating what what power dynamics are at play are are super important and. Um, expanding beyond, you know, just thinking about race, class, and gender, but really thinking about how do how does um, ableism, how do how do the, how does a nation state, how does citizenship, how do these other um, identity systems of domination, systems of power, also impact the work that we're doing? Um, if we're not having that analysis, then we might be leaving out certain bodies, right? So when we're thinking about not only how does this technology will impact body seven generations down the line, I'm not just thinking about my human kin, I'm thinking about my energetic, spiritual, emotional, physical bodies, but I'm also thinking about my collective bodies, like the bodies of water, land, um, plant, plant ancestors, right? That I'm also in relationship with. Um, so really expanding again, be, beyond this Western view of, what gets seen as valued and what does not get seen as valued um, as we're thinking about it, intersectionality is definitely um, at the center for me. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, as usual, resonate with my fellow uh, folks. I think one of the really useful things, um, questions I found in life is the difference between reformist reforms and radical reforms. Um, and I think like knowing that, that it's not a question, right? But like, a, is this a radical reform or a reformist reform is a question. And right, the difference is like a, right? It can, it is sometimes true or at least feels like it's a plausible way to describe each of our actions is like every day you do a small thing, right? Like most days, you are not, um, I would never say that I am abolishing something in one moment in my life, but I do feel like I'm taking a small step in one direction or another. And the question to keep asking myself, is that a small step 
that like basically feeds into the existing systems or is it a small step that actually radically moves in a different direction so with technology this is often things like oh like am i trying to make this technology a little more fair that's like a big theme right now for those of you who like know or notice anything about ai is that there's a wave of fair ai which is laughable right and it's a perfect example of like folks doing these reformist reforms by saying oh fair ai will make ai better so google can use this technology and have this ethics washed version of it and you can compare that against radical reforms right these choices to like to create um, other communities creating other types of intimate democratized technologies. You can think about creating communities that aren't using technologies at all um, to create care for one another. There's, but you can talk about like organizing and labor organizing. Um, so I think that's like the question here. And I think it is also deeply connected um, to what you just said about, about different roles. And I think that's the other question that I've often found useful is like, um, there are many roles in organizing and abolition and abolition of the carceral state. And one, sometimes your role changes throughout life and you don't need to hold yourself to one role. And one thing to notice is like, if you have the privilege to take on a role in which you're challenging the system without like you know, completely committing deep violence to yourself, then you should really seriously consider taking on that role, right? And this is that kind of like the microcosm of this is, you know, a friend of mine talked to someone um, who was a friend of someone who was creating violence in the world. And that intermediary, like white man, not surprisingly said like, oh, you know, I'll cut them off which is absurd, right? Like this is a situation in which like that is not his role. His role is to fight the fight. Whereas maybe my friend in this situation, like her role is to spend time with me to create communities of care, right? To like reconnect to supporting her, her family, which is like an immigrant family. Um, so I think it's really knowing your role. Um, yeah, so I, I love both of those concepts. It's always messy um, and you know, I'll, I'll pause there because I think there's always so much to say, but I think both of those questions feel like really useful lenses to just ask ourselves again and again. Yeah, I just want to add real quick um, to the first question. Rhea, I'm really glad you brought up um, like radical versus reformist reforms because I think that is a useful framework. I, it does feel like right now a lot of the discourse around the tech industry, especially when it comes from, you know, the from politicians and people who are in a position to do something is that they are interested in market reforms and specifically reforms that are fairly reformist. They're not necessarily shifting the balance of power in any interesting way. They're more just like, you know, shuffling some things around, um, sometimes ethics washing, sometimes just like breaking up some companies into smaller entities that will not necessarily do anything different. It's a little bit disappointing, I think, because of that, I'm personally more interested in non-market reforms like I feel like there's a lot of potential in organizing um, that isn't tr just trying to change the conditions under which companies operate in the market um, but I also do think that like, there is still potential in those avenues for changing things I think hopefully those two types of organizing will work in tandem and that we will see them kind of feed off each other but other than that it is it is uh, definitely a little bit the the current um, state of like tech industry criticism and when you know what to do about the tech industry just feels very much like it's quite far from where we need to be but you know uh one can hope that it will change thank you wendy and ria and cecia for um answering these questions um for the sake of time we are going to move into breakout rooms but first um i want uh we had Sean Wiggins have a question and we were going to have him pose that question and we're also going to go off of Kari's question too that we can repost in the chat when we go into breakout rooms um, but Sean if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question and then we can discuss in our little groups together hey uh, thank you so much for speaking um, just a little context. I'm a math teacher at City College, and I'm teaching the first data science course. 
here. And I'm also teaching like the, it's kind of like the last math course that CS majors take. So I'm like working with like the students that like kind of came up in conversation tonight about, um, it's almost like a necessary, like I need this job, I need this money, I need this opportunity. Um, but I'm also building the program and I can tell like the UC's hands are deep in this, the big tech's hands are deep in this and expanding on cheap labor, um, et cetera. Do you have any like comments towards us, like me and fellow teachers and like students here who are like considering their like future goals and like, yeah, you know, just exploring new career options? And that's definitely something that um, I think will make for really good uh, breakout conversation um, for people who are in that role, for people who are considering that role, for those of us who have pretty much no connection to the tech industry, but you know are invested in learning about these things because it affects us. Um, and to that end, we will now go into breakout rooms until about 7.55 or so. Um, if at any time you're uncomfortable in the breakout room, feel free to return to the main session, or if you are just like too tired to take part in conversation, you can stay here as well. Presenters, you're welcome to stay and join the breakout rooms if you'd like, but it's also fine if you'd like to leave. Thank you so much for your presentations, everyone. Really appreciate it. Um, the discussion question uh, will be, what abolition technology can be created for our community safety or mutual aid efforts? And I will put that in the chat real quick. And if you um, can, please uh, elect someone or nominate someone or decide on someone to uh, report back so that we can reflect together at the end briefly. I'm really quick. We're back from breakout rooms. <laughs> Let me look at my script. Um, yeah, I guess let's do the, so thank you everyone for being in the breakout rooms. Um, uh, would any BIPOC folks like to share their reflection from their breakout room first? Sean? <laughs> <laughs> You're all <a> funny. <laughs> anyway, it was just basically fuck techies. Um, and it was just like, at the end of the day, like, it's, it's one thing to move to a city um, for a job because like that always happens. I gave an example of how my family has been here since like the gold rush, right? Like, which is literally right after like, well, not, I forget, no, okay. I forget when the gold rush was specifically. However, right, my ancestors made it to California and they sat there and they gave into the culture, right? They became a part of the culture and they had been so for a very, very long fucking time. And a lot of my relatives now, they don't live in the city anymore, you know, except for distant cousins and they're all the way out. So basically to say this, like it's one thing to move because you want to give to the culture of a city, but it's another thing to move and then displace hella people and then fuck up an entire system and fuck up an entire genealogy, right? And be completely ignorant to it. 1849, right on. So at the end of the day, that's like, that's a hundred and fucking 70 something years here. And like, you just come in and you displace a whole group, like a whole family, it's just, it's wild. So it's one thing to move to a city and give four to a city. It's another thing to move to it and take away. And that's really it. Fuck techies, especially in the city. Thank you for sharing back with us. Um, I feel that 100%. I, full disclosure, when I'm facilitating, I don't go into the breakout rooms. I am just wiped by the end of it. Um, so I'm really glad to uh, here's some report, some reports back. Um, I think there were multiple uh, breakout rooms, if that's correct. Um, would folks from any of the other breakout rooms uh, like to share what y'all talked about?
Um, what I'm picking up is that folks are pretty low energy. Um, so if we are wanting to, oh. oh. Shireen, would you share for Maggie? Sorry to put you on the spot. Oh, yeah, we didn't have a very long conversation, um, but we were just kind of talking about uh, get, getting the class. Well, she was starting to tell me some interesting things that we got, got moved back into the main room, but um, just getting the class um, in as part of a main, um, I don't know. I, I, you're still working on getting this as it's like a permanent class right now. I was just asking her about that, but I didn't get to hear the answer yet. Yes, I believe this is um, a pilot that we're doing um, so that we can try to have a transformative justice certificate around some something around there. Um, Era has all the details and other folks in the collective. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, Rhea, you have a quiet ask for folks. Oh, my quiet ask is just going to be, especially if we're feeling quiet or lower energy, I wonder if any folks would like to just drop in the chat, like the word or few words you would love to um, for technology to be, um, or the alternative that you would rather have. I feel like I really enjoy that question. I know I use the phrase intimacy a lot when I described it. Um, I would love to see any answers. And obviously for folks who can't type, feel welcome to say words out loud. And if we'd rather not do this, I accept that invitation as well. Gracie put in the chat, um, I like your idea, Rhea. I was going to say generative and compostable. Um, really quick, I do want to say that Gracie popped in the chat that um, their group talked a bit about how worker organizing could be taught to engineering students and sustainability of materials used for our work like lithium for electric cars. <clears throat> and that there is a class on sustainable energy taught by Hitesh Soneji um as well but yeah that's that's a really dope idea it, does anyone else have words that they think of to Rhea's prompt oh um i did get a message that um Gion might be uh interested in sharing a reflection is that the case shoot it from the hip hey sorry um, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so I was actually thinking about children a lot um, in our uh, breakout group. Um, it was kind of a large group, so I didn't get to speak, but I also wanted to throw this back onto like what we were talking about um, because our conversation was actually pretty great. Um, but I was thinking in the original question, um, if there is a way we can interact with technology in our everyday life. Um, sorry, I feel like I'm putting it on the spot, so my bad. Um, but I just, I was thinking about like white hackers or white hat hackers. Do y'all know about this? Um, in, in these like um, tech companies, there are hackers that like solve like you know like people can infil inf infiltrate like the system and stuff and like they have people specifically to fix those bugs um but you know like there's nuances to why people do tech um a lot of people are i mean like some people are just like come from working class families and want to do better than their parents you know there's all those types of things and so you know not everybody goes into it thinking about ethics, but is there space for people to think about like how, um, what's it called? Like how we can use 
this insidious platform to do good um, is what I'll say, like partially. And then also in the Bay Area, there's a lot of children um, who are taking tech classes, learning coding at this young age. And I think like in, in San Francisco, in the Bay Area, like there's a lot of energy towards being able to change, like really shift, like what the path is for technology, I guess. Um, and yeah, I have a lot of thoughts, but I don't really know how to um, continue on, but I will give an example. Um, for an example, um, FedEx, um, there was someone within the company, the corporation that um, was probably white, uh, but had this code for uh, BIPOC to use to ship things for basically free. And this code was just like a code that was just like spread amongst like community to um, just move, you know, just using, having this resource available in, in, in like the realm of like reparations for BIPOC. Um, and so I think that's really interesting too, within the system, there are people that we have, we have, but, um, um, and like that can, that can also exist because there are like, you know, like niches into where there's faults in these systems that aren't perfect. Um, but I, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you for sharing all of that with us. And I'm so sorry for putting you on the spot. Um, I wasn't sure if you'd seen like the, the message that I'd sent back to you, um, but we are um, just a little bit past time. Um, so we're gonna begin to wrap things up. Um, thank you again for ev to everyone who came, everyone who spoke, everyone who listened in, participated in any way, shape or form. Um, we really, really appreciate your presence here. And we appreciate, you know, the energy and the care that you bring to this class. Um, and for the folks that, you know, may have joined us for the first time today, um, you know, thank you for being willing to jump in like mid-semester um, and that we will be having just a few more classes on uh, Mondays and Wednesdays. Um, we, if you need like a link to the syllabus or anything, um, you know, get in contact with the coordinators or with the um, the main kind of uh, accounts for everything, and we'll get that back to you. So thank you, everyone, and good night. <laughs>